Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Chad Delwerman? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. This case takes place in Ohio in 2023. 32-year-old Chad Christopher Dowerman lived in a house on the 1900 block of Laurel Lindale Road in New Richmond, Ohio. This is in Claremont County, about 30 minutes southeast of Cincinnati. Chad lived with his wife, Laura, three sons and one stepdaughter. The sons were named Hunter, Clayton, and Chase. They were ages seven, four, and three. The stepdaughter is a teenager. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On June 15, 2023, at 4.15 p.m., the police received a 911 call from a woman who was screaming that her babies had been shot. Presumably, this woman was Laura, the mother of Chad's three sons. At 4.18 p.m., three minutes later, a second 911 call was received. A motorist who was driving by reported a girl running down the road saying that her father was killing everyone. Later, the girl was identified as Chad's stepdaughter. When the police arrived at Chad's house, they could see the bodies of his sons in his yard. They could also see Chad sitting calmly on a step outside his house. The officers screamed commands to Chad from the road, telling him to stand up, put his hands in the air, and walked toward them, Chad did not move. They tried to approach under cover to protect themselves. Undoubtedly, they were concerned that Chad could open fire on them, which was a valid concern considering there were bodies in his yard. As they walked closer to Chad, they continued screaming commands, but Chad just sat there. There was a rifle on the step next to him. The officers grabbed Chad, threw him to the ground, and handcuffed him. An officer asked Chad, what are you doing, man? Chad responded, can I roll over? I ain't going to hurt ya. I ain't going to hurt nobody. Chad mentioned how his dog would not bite the officers as long as they did not try to reach for him or pet him. The officer then said, what's going on, man? Chad said, nothing. Can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. When the officers were escorting Chad to a police cruiser, he asked, can you get the wallet out of my pocket? One police officer can be heard saying, quote, shut up, dude. You have the right to remain silent. Blank, use it, unquote. Paramedics attempted to revive Chad's sons, but all three children died at the scene. Chad's wife had been shot in the hand while grabbing the gun in an effort to protect her sons. She was taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Chad was charged with three counts of aggravated murder. The police said that there were no signs of forced entry into the house, and they are not looking for any other suspects. Chad allegedly confessed to lining up his three sons in the yard before killing them with a rifle. One of his sons had fled into a field, but Chad chased him down, brought him back, and shot him to death. Chad said that he had been planning the murders for several months. At the time making this video, Chad is in jail. His bond is set at $20 million, which is the highest in the history of Claremont County. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. After the murders, many different people talked about their experiences with Chad and their impressions of him. A few examples. Chad's father said that he and his wife were still trying to comprehend their son's actions. They have no answers. Chad just snapped. The father suggested that Chad probably hid a lot of stuff from him. The father had just visited Chad a week earlier. At that time, Chad seemed fine and was joking around. One of Chad's friends said, quote, he had a bad temper, really bad. I think he was a bomb ready to explode, unquote. When talking about Chad, a neighbor said, quote, he was angry every day. There wasn't a day he didn't yell at his wife and his kids out there, unquote. 
the president of a baseball league where the murder victims played, encountered Chad and his sons the day before the shooting. He implied that nothing was out of the ordinary with Chad. Item number two, Chad did not have any criminal history, although he did have many traffic citations on his record. In 2010, Chad was charged in a domestic violence incident. He allegedly choked his father. The case was dismissed when his father failed to appear as a witness for the state. Item number three, just a few days before the shooting, Chad changed his profile image on Facebook to a photograph of his three sons. He also posted other photographs of himself with his sons. Often when parents post images of their children on social media, it's because they're proud of them. It's not connected to any type of homicidal behavior. This makes it seem as though Chad may not have planned the homicide in advance, like he said he did. Item number four, the act of a parent killing their own children is referred to as filicide. Here's what the research tells us about this phenomenon. In about 66% of these cases, the perpetrator is the mother of the children. 34% of the time, it's the father. About 50% of filicides are also familicides. That is, the perpetrator not only kills the children, but kills the mother or the father of the children. Between 40 and 60% of the cases involve the perpetrator bringing an end to their own lives. Here are the typical characteristics of the killer in the cases where the perpetrator is the father. The average age is 31. He often has several mental health conditions. This could include depression, personality pathology, substance use disorder, obsessive compulsive symptoms, paranoia, or psychosis. He is psychotic about 40% of the time. He tends to be unemployed, undereducated, poor, and socially isolated. And the average age of the victims is five years old, which is older than when a mother is the perpetrator. There are five main types of filicide. These types apply to both male and female killers. The altruistic type is when the parent commits the homicide because they believe it is in the best interest of the children. This is by far the most common type, accounting for 35% of the incidents. The perpetrator thinks that their children are better off no longer being alive. The world is too savage, inhumane, harsh, and unforgiving. The purpose of the murder is to relieve suffering. The perpetrators often view the victims as having a disability, which makes existence intolerable or brutal. The second type is acutely psychotic. This is where the parent is suffering from psychosis. There is no rational basis for the murder. The killer may believe that the government, demons, or aliens have commanded them to commit the murder, or they may think that the victims are dangerous. For example, the notorious killer Lori Vallow believed her victims were zombies possessed by demons. The third type is unwanted child. This is when the parent views their children as an inconvenience. For example, the killer has another romantic interest in mind who does not want the children or the killer believes they don't want the children. This is thought to be the motivation for the notorious Watts family murder. The killer in that case, Chris Watts, was having an affair, which made having a family inconvenient. The fourth type is accidental. This includes instances where the perpetrator was committing another crime, but did not intend to commit murder. Factitious disorder imposed on another, or Munchausen syndrome by proxy, as it's sometimes called, falls under this type. The last type is called spouse revenge. This is the least frequent type, accounting for only 2% of the incidents. The motivation here is to make the non-offending spouse suffer because their children have been killed. The perpetrator in this type is almost always a man. This takes me to item number five. What do I think happened in the case of Chad Dellerman? Not a lot is known about Chad's history, I'm sure more information will become available in the future. At this point, based on the available evidence, here's what I think happened. This is just a theory, my opinion. Chad Dowerman was an erratic and impulsive individual who had difficulty controlling his temper. On the day of the shooting, he had some type of fight with his wife. Maybe he perceived that she was going to leave him or something to that effect, like the relationship was threatened in some way. 
This may have been an unreasonable assumption, but it might have been what he believed. In a moment of narcissistic rage, Chad acted out in a way that he knew would devastate his wife. He murdered his three sons in front of her. It was important for him to pull the trigger as she watched. This is why he brought the one son who fled back to the yard to kill him. This is also why Chad did not kill his wife. He shot her in the hand so he could proceed with the murders, but he did not want her to die. Chad deliberately made sure that she lived so that she could suffer for the rest of her life without her sons. On the body camera video, a woman's voice can be heard in the background. Presumably, this is Chad's wife, Laura. The voice said, They're dead, aren't they? They're so little. You took my life from me. I believe this is exactly the effect that Chad was looking for. He accomplished his goal. It was critical to him that his wife be in as much pain as possible. When the police arrived, Chad made it a point not to comply or to resist. He was neutral. He was trying to underscore that his mission was done. There was nothing more for him to do, no one else he wanted to hurt. Now all he had to do was sit back and enjoy his revenge. He is a joyful witness to the pain he has caused so many. In Chad's mind, the killing was unpleasant, but necessary to protect his ego and defend his honor. He wasn't angry at his sons, rather he was angry at his wife. He wanted to show her what he believed her behavior had caused, as if he was saying, look what you made me do. It's an ultimate expression of gaslighting. Chad was not going to stand by and be rejected as his sons were accepted. He and his sons were a package deal. He had played a part in creating them and would not be left behind. This is why he did not harm his stepdaughter. Chad appears to have characteristics of vulnerable narcissism. He was vindictive, petty, self-centered, sadistic, and had no empathy. Now moving to my final thoughts. The type of homicide featured in this case is extremely hard to predict. Even if a person had all the typical characteristics of one of these killers, they are still highly unlikely to commit this type of crime. It is a low probability event. One of the few ways to protect against this type of crime would be to avoid relationships with vulnerable narcissists, but even that does not guarantee safety. In addition, there are so many vulnerable narcissists in the world, it's just about impossible to avoid them all. Those are my thoughts on the case of Chad Dellerman. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.